Psalm 77, let's start this again at verse 1 where Asaph, the author here, says, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. A uh, very simple beginning here, uh, but we already gather that there is uh, some sort of turmoil in the author's life. We don't know exactly what it is. The context of the psalm is uncertain. Uh, we're not given any such details. But the tone, even from verse 1, is pretty clear. And so though we don't know the reason for his trouble, uh, you can't deny that it's there. And that's going to be the case in many of our lives. We don't know the reason for the trouble, but we can't deny the fact that it's there. Things bother us. There are going to be some days you wake up and realize it's going to be a bad one, and you're not sure why. Uh, sometimes we chalk that up as spiritual attacks. Sometimes we chalk that up as hormones. Uh, whatever the case may be, there are times like these. And whatever it was for him in this psalm, it seems to be springing up more so from inner conflict than outward trouble. And so what we have in this 20-verse chapter is a private uh, dialogue of a man who's in, in a battle within his own mind. The trouble that he faces seems to be of such a nature that uh, Asaph has nobody to turn to, so he cries to God. No one to turn to but God. It's him and God. He says he's crying out to God, not to a colleague, a friend. He doesn't have the opportunity to seek out the help of a fellow prophet uh, or someone else who shared the space of the choir with him or perhaps the priest of the temple. He doesn't even have the uh, opportunity to seek the king's counsel. He worked beneath David. Doesn't say anything about him trying to find consolation from his wife, assuming he had one, and I believe he did. He certainly had sons and descendants, and yet it's just him and God. His trouble was so deep, so private, there wasn't a single person in his life or on this planet that he could confide in. He's lonely. He's got nobody. And so what does he do? He cries to God. What's he supposed to do? In verse 2, he says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing, and my soul refused to be comforted. <clears throat> now, uh, if Asaph is like the average man or woman, uh, he could have and may perhaps have tried uh, to comfort himself in a hundred different ways. Um, sometimes extra sleep is sought, a nap hot bath, vacation to the hills, some time off, TV, music. Whether he tried these things or not, we don't know. But if he did, they didn't work. His soul was still vexed, refusing comfort. There's going to be times in a person's life when God lets nothing help you. Nothing. And no one. You can't find help. You can't find relief. You're left alone with God and God only. And, and it's awful. See, we all think, well, you know, Jesus is, is all I need. And, you know, Jesus is my comfort. And Jesus is my strength. I know the verses too. And I also know what verse 3 says. I remembered God and was troubled. <laughs> I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. He's admitting here that when he sought God, when he remembered God, he was troubled, not comforted. Thinking about God disturbed him. There's going to be times in your life where God's omniscience, the fact that he knows everything, and his omnipresence, the fact that he you, you can't get away from him, is a comfort to you. There's going to be times where that's a comforting reality to you. There's going to be other times for the servant of God when it's a haunting reality. Times where you, cause just, you wish you could forget God, 
You wish that perhaps you could just take a break from him. You're wore out from thinking about God. He's always in your head and you can't get away. We, you, you wish you could escape the reality of his constant oversight and authority. Where the very thought of God makes you so miserable, you want to run away from the Lord's presence and forget him. And yet for those of us who dare to try, it only increases your misery. You find out the hard way, don't you? And then you're left with the thought that maybe you're evil. Why would I do that? Why do I not like God? What's wrong with me? You feel like you're probably liable to punishment because with those kinds of thoughts, you know you deserve it. You start to wonder if perhaps God isn't so upset with you that he's just going to kill you. Strike you with lightning. These are things that Asaph is going through. Uh, Jonah went through similar things. He ran away from the presence of the Lord. Don't overlook stuff like that. These are prophets, disciples, servants of God, chosen and elect, who did their best to get away from him because they were sick of God, disturbed by God. They sought comfort from him and didn't get it, so they didn't particularly like God. Whatever the case was, they wanted distance. It may alarm some people to hear me suggest that this can happen to a born-again Christian because we all think that that should never happen. But it's been said that this psalm, Psalm 77, is for experienced saints only, those with experience. See, if you trifle in things of God and you just kind of dabble in Christianity, you're probably never going to feel this way. You're probably always going to like God because you keep him in a box. You, you put him over here where he's safe. He's, he's like a lion and you've tamed him. But for those who jump into the Christian life with both feet and follow Christ like Christ is meant to be followed, it wears you out. What would, it, what would you say if I suggested to you tonight that God's presence in Christ's life stressed Jesus out? We all know that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was well acquainted with grief, and I believe that much of it stemmed from his relationship to God. I would contend that though Jesus' relationship with God was perfect, because it was, they had perfect love one for the other. Their relationship was healthy and without flaw, yet it certainly wasn't comfortable. Don't ever imagine that their relationship wasn't without tension. Luke tells us that Jesus' relationship with God was filled with such tension that it caused Jesus to sweat blood. Setting that aside for a moment, are you in or have you ever experienced a relationship with another human being that stressed you out? Such that you wanted to just get away from them? Take a break? Yeah? But it never made you sweat blood, did it? Jesus' relationship with his father did. Have we forgotten Hebrews 5 verse 8 that says that Jesus learned obedience? You know what that tells us? Obedience didn't come natural. He had to learn it. And God was the one. His father taught him how to obey. You know how he taught him? That verse tells us through suffering. God taught Jesus how to obey through suffering. Jesus was only allowed to say and only allowed to do what God permitted him to say and do. Would you like to live your entire life under that short of a leash? The answer is no. The answer is no. And for those of us who do all that we can to put ourselves beneath the all, all, all sovereign authority of God, we know what a short leash feels like, and you and I both buck and kick against it all too often, don't we? Jesus never did. And you're telling me that he enjoyed that? Did you know that Jesus had a different will than God did? When he prayed on the night of his arrest, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. So there were times in Christ's life when him and God had conflicting wills. And yet every single time Jesus forced himself to do what God wanted instead of doing what he himself 
wanted. You remember on the cross, Jesus couldn't contain himself, and in spite of his physical loss of strength, he cried out with a loud voice, Why did you leave me? God? Why? It was his relationship to God that was his source of anguish. Don't think that it was the crucifixion itself. Lots of people got crucified. The worst part about Christ's scenario was the relationship with God. He was beneath his wrath. So believe you me, there are going to be times when our relationship with God is tried. This psalm is an expose of one such trial for a man named Asaph. If we, if we look at the details of Scripture, we can see very clearly that serving God is going to knock a person down and rip a person up. Jesus' life and death prove that very clearly, as well as many other of God's servants whose lives are recorded on the pages of Scripture. He writes in verse 4, You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled I can't even speak. You know what he's saying when he says, You hold my eyes open? It means that God is forcing Asaph to see things he'd rather not look at. Not only is he keeping him awake at night, but he's making him look at stuff that he doesn't want to see. There's a lot of people out there, and you've probably heard the saying. Some people say, ignorance is bliss. You heard that, right? Do you know why that's a saying? Because on occasion it is. There are some things I'd rather not know. There are some things I'd rather unlearn. There are some things I'd like to unsee. But there are many things that God won't allow me to. Ignorance may be bliss, but sometimes ignorance isn't an option. And God's going to make you look at stuff that's going to bring you a lot of pain and perhaps sleepless nights. God is going to bring things to your attention so terrible and so troubling that words no longer help. He says, I'm so troubled, I can't speak. Well, that wasn't always the case. If you go back to verse 1, you read again the first three verses. He used to be able to speak. He used to cry out to God. He cried out to God with his voice. In verse 3, he says, I, was com I, com I complained. But now by verse 4, he's going, I can't even talk anymore. So apparently things have gone from bad to worse for this guy, all in the matter of four short verses. And for all his crying out and for all his seeking God and all of his complaining, relief has still been withheld. And not only has it been withheld from Asaph, but the misery that he's experiencing has exponentially increased. So all his efforts for seeking God and praying and trying to, it hasn't helped one bit. It's only made it worse. This may be somewhat unfamiliar to you. But these are lessons that God plans to put all of his servants through. One author says, most often when the believer cries out to God and senses that they are heard, it brings the peaceful assurance of faith. Ah, but this is not always the case. Sometimes, especially when we remain in our difficulty instead of being delivered from it, knowing that God has heard us and still does nothing brings more frustration, not less. So you cry out and God hears you and you know that he hears you, but he does nothing about it. That's not going to help. <laughs> it's going to make it worse. So keep up your crying and keep up your seeking and keep up your pleading and keep up your complaining. God is under no obligation to bring you the relief that you so desire. So I ask you tonight, how do you respond when God holds your head underwater longer than you would like? With joy and praise? <laughs> Is that how you respond? I appreciate psalms like this and texts in scripture that reveal that I'm not the only servant of God who feels this way. Because there are times when I wish I could quit, where I could erase God from my memory. Be done with it. I don't like the way God's treating me, and I do feel like he's holding my head underwater. I feel like he's going to keep me there until I go unconscious, just so he can drag my body up and revive it again. 
And I don't always like that. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. In verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart. <clears throat> my spirit makes diligent search. I don't know if I'm reading the text correctly, but it seems to me that there could be a, a fair amount of self-pity present in verse 5 and 6. I want you to notice how his the, the trouble that he's dealing with in his mind has led to uh, deep introspection. Because I'm looking at the pronouns that are being used. My, I, 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 my, I, my, my. <laughs> And it's interesting to me because if you look at those two verses, it seems that Asaph is listing out all the things he's done right. I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. Right? I'm singing praise songs. It ain't helping. I meditate within my heart. Like, what more am I supposed to do? My spirit makes diligent search. I'm trying. God. He's almost proving to himself that he doesn't deserve what he's receiving from God. I did what I'm supposed to do. Why am I still getting this? Now, his introspection may not be the root cause of his misery, but I will tell you uh, that it's not helping. And it's certainly not going to get him out of it. Okay, that kind of introspection, I'm not going to go so far as to say you should never do it. I do think you should take a good look at, at yourself and check your heart every once in a while. But if you're just sitting in it, <laughs> like stewing in it, it's all about you. You're self-absorbed. You're going nowhere. Okay, look at where it takes him. Look at verse seven. Will the Lord cast off forever? I mean, this, these just now a series of six questions that are just leading to despair. So, oh, will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgot to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? <laughs> the mind goes in predictable places in times like these. Where your mind will go when you're being under the when you're put under the gun like this, it's predictable. You're going to start wondering: Is God my enemy? Like, is God against me? I'm never going to recover from this. I, I think this is the end. I've outsinned God's ability to forgive. I really feel like God's had enough of me. I can't trust His promises anymore. I don't know if it applies to me. His word is no longer reliable. I know for a fact that he's given his attention to others and forgotten me. He's turned his back on me. I still see him blessing other people, but it's over for me, and it's all because he's mad. He's mad at me. I must have done something wrong. I don't even know if I could put my finger on it, but I know it's over. So he asks himself a series of six questions, and you will do the same thing. Your mind will race with all kinds of irrational thoughts and questions that only plummet you deeper into your despair. And I would caution you on being careful about how you answer the questions that your mind naturally asks when it's drowning in despair. Be careful how you answer these questions, Asaph. Depending on how you handle verses 7, 8, and 9 when you're in it, you can actually be tempted to vengeance against God and his people. You can work yourself into such a frustrated sort of frenzy against God that you start to think that, well, if God's written me off, then I might as well write him off. Walk away. Live as I please. Right? God abandoned you. I guess I'll return the favor. There are a lot of people, I believe, in, in the situation that Asaph is in up to and through verse 9. I believe there's a lot of people who have been in that situation 
who decided that they would teach God a lesson. Even if it meant destroying themselves in the meantime, I'm going to teach God a lesson. He'll be sorry I left. I'm going to walk away from his people. They'll be sorry. And you know what the ironic thing is? His people never are. His people have always carried on just fine. The only one that gets hurt, the only one that is destroyed, is the one who walks away. So be very careful how you answer those questions when your mind starts thinking up all kinds of questions. Selah. You know what that means. It means take some time and think about it. Don't blow through this. Okay, let this be more than just a Bible study. The Holy Spirit is telling us to stop and think. Take some time. Because all the questions that were just asked, those six questions, you don't really know the answer, do you? Especially when you're in the depths of despair. You don't know the answer to those questions, do you? So what are you going to do about it? Has God cast off forever? Has his mercy run out? What are you going to do? <laughs> There's nothing you can do. What if, what if God decided to write you off? Can you change his mind? Can you change the mind of God? Scripture asks a rhetorical question. Will God receive your counsel? What if God did choose to withhold grace and mercy for the rest of your life? You going to march on up to heaven and just take some for yourself? Against his will? Like what if God decided to become your enemy? So Asaph now here in verse 9 takes time to think about this. And here's the conclusion he comes to. Look at verse 10. I said, after having thought about it, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Now, if that confuses you, what Asaph is, is, is saying here, uh, the, new, the, the New Living Translation puts it this way. This is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. This is my fate. This is my anguish. It's mine. My. He's taking ownership. He's taking, he's finally coming to grips with the reality of his miserable situation. He's going, well, it's just the way it is. Maybe God has forsaken me. Maybe I am out of the club. Whatever the case may be, I can stop looking for something better now because this is what it is. And so Asaph, after thinking about it, has come to the point where he's learned to accept what God has allowed. Painful or not, it doesn't really matter. And I couldn't change it if I tried. And I did try, and it didn't change, so I'm done. When you find yourself in a situation like this, and your condition won't improve, it's because God expects you to improve. So all your praying, all your fasting, all your effort, if it hasn't moved God, it's probably because God expects you to do the moving. If God won't grant you relief, it's because you're proud or in great danger of it. And something needs to be done, and so God's doing it. And the only way to deliver you from harm is to make you humble. That's it. There's no way around it. And God will do whatever he has to do to make you humble. Second Corinthians 12, you remember the Apostle Paul prayed that God would take away the pain of some awful situation. We don't know what it was. He just calls it a thorn in the flesh. The Apostle Paul prayed to God that he'd take it away and God ignored him. Paul cried out a second time, and still nothing. Finally, he sought God a third time, and at last he got his answer, but it wasn't the answer he wanted. What was God's answer? My grace is all you get. I'm not going to change your situation. I'm not going to deliver you from the pain. My grace is all you get because my grace is all you need. And Paul reports in that same chapter that humility was accomplished. 
And in retrospect, he realized that it was all done by God in grace because Paul was in danger of getting too proud. It humbled Paul to be ignored by God for a time and then to be left alone in his pain. And the humility that Paul gained from that experience saved him from any future harm that he would have suffered had he been left to his own pride. So when we find ourselves in a situation that brings Psalm 77 to life for you or I, we need to remember what God is up to. Though it hurts right now, God is saving you from greater pain tomorrow. So learn the lesson of humility that you may be delivered from the clutches of pride. After his experience, the Apostle Paul wrote, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses <laughs> and in insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Then I'm strong. And so Paul learned his lesson. Asaph here in Psalm 77 is learning a lesson that God will attempt to teach us all. It's a lesson that if we learn it, we will be able to say, like Paul, I've learned to be content in all things, whether I'm full or hungry, whether I abound or I suffer. doesn't really matter anymore. I'm fine with whatever God allows. And I, I don't know whether any of us are there yet. If any of us does feel that we've arrived at that place, God will be sure to, to show you otherwise. If anybody here thinks they're humble, you'd be surprised at how proud you still are doesn't take much for the Lord to turn your world upside down and bring you back into the classroom of humility. In verse 11, Asaph says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. He says, I will remember three times. I will remember, I will remember. Then he says, I will meditate. I'm going to do this. You notice that he's determined now. There's a great amount of determination that's being expressed in his words. He's determined to think about God now rather than himself. So Asaph is moving from introspection to a position where he's filling his mind with thoughts of God. You remember in verses five and six, it was my, I, 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 my, I, my, my. But in verses 12 through 20, get this. It's your, you, you, your, you, your, your, you, you, your, 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 you, your. <laughs> it's all about God now. All about God. This is a very important mental discipline for uh, you and I to practice until it's perfected. <clears throat> you, uh, you could and might, unfortunately, uh, dwell all your life on how hard you have it and how big your mistakes are, but it isn't going to get you anywhere. So the sooner you can learn to make your attention uh, Godward, the better off you'll be uh, for, for, from here on for the rest of your life. And it's not just enough to remember God like Asaph is determined to do. Uh, he says, I will talk of your deeds, which is precisely what he does for the rest of the psalm. And for the rest of his trial, okay, he's going to do this until it's over. So in verse 13, he says, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have, with your arm, redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Up until this point, Asaph has been crying out and complaining and questioning God. And now he decidedly changes his tune. He's not doing that anymore. Crying and complaining, that comes easily. But to make yourself speak in a positive way about, about the God that you've been questioning, about the God whose treatment of you you don't necessarily appreciate, 
when you decide that you are going to speak in a positive way about the God that you, for a spell, didn't like at all, that's not only righteous, that's healthy. When you decide that you are going to counter the evil that's in your heart that wants to complain and wants to whine and wants to blame God and question God, when you decide in your heart that you are no longer going to tolerate that, but instead praise him and remember him and extol him and do all those things that we ought to be doing, that's healthy. It's a turning point in anyone's life. And in the addition of another Selah, because there's a few in this psalm, uh, that's an implication that just because we can vocalize the truth, because anybody can do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean we've yet learned the lesson. Like, eh, anybody can spout off some verses, and like anybody, you know, we can all stand and sing the same song. We can all, with our mouth, speak the things of God. We can vocalize truth. But that doesn't mean that we have learned our lesson. Only God, our great teacher, knows when we've passed the test. And only God knows when his instruction has run its full course. So he's, just because we stand up and sing, doesn't mean he's going to go, oh, I guess the trial's over. They've learned their lesson. No, he's still looking beneath the surface. That's why even when you come to church, it might not fix it you might still go home and find yourself under the same heat that you were when you showed up hoping this would fix it. You thought you were going to get an arm around the shoulder and we were all going to, you know, oh, it'll be okay. And it was all going to go away. And we were all going to pray with you. Let's huddle around and lay hands on, you know, and it doesn't work. And you start wondering, well, what, what's the fix? The fix is for you to get humble, for you to break. Ta-da. <laughs> no secret there. In verse 16, he says, the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. There seems to be a reference here to the Old Testament account of the parting of the Red Sea. Not a surprise. Many authors refer back to that situation as one of the greatest acts of God, perhaps the greatest act of God aside of Christ's Death and resurrection. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea. Your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So here Asaph is remembering the parting of the Red Sea, which I would say is one of the greatest uh, acts of God in all of world's history. Uh, and I'd say that because to you and me, the parting of the Red Sea is a picture of our salvation. And apart from Christ's death and resurrection, which uh, gave opportunity for the salvation of, of all men and all women, um, the second greatest miracle in my world anyway, is when somebody actually does get saved. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. And Asaph now is remembering that. So what is it that you ought to meditate on when you feel that God has cut you off? Maybe your salvation. Maybe you ought to, in your own mind, go back to that day when you saw God part the Red Sea and you walked across on dry ground and were saved from the oppressiveness of sin. That'd probably be a good thing for you to think about. That would be a wonderful thing for you to meditate on. Um, verse 16, going back, the waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. Uh, remember how God obliter obliterated all obstacles that stood in the way of your being saved, how he let nothing stop you. He didn't let the waters stand in the way of the Israelites crossing over the Red Sea, and he didn't let anything stand in your way of being saved. You should remember that. You should remember in verse 17, the clouds poured out water, the sky sent out, the arrows also flashed about. Remember back in your own life how everything seemed to cooperate in that moment. All of creation worked together as you were stepping into the light of God's life. Everything working together to deliver you from sin. Remember your own salvation. In verse 18, the voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Remember back to how his word came with power into your life. The first time your mind was illuminated like flashes of lightning. How you were able to hear the truth as clearly as you can hear thunder. And how you responded to that with the deepest of reverence enough to make you tremble and shake at how great God was. You should remember that kind of stuff. You remember when you were saved? 
Or have you never experienced that? In verse 19, your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, your footsteps were not known. Remember back to how God was with you and how his will for your life, which was for so long hidden, suddenly became visible. How you all of a sudden understood what God wanted from you. You could see it now, just like the floor of the Red Sea when God parted the waters. What was forever hidden is now in plain view. Remember back to how God led you into a new life, even using other people to give you the guidance you needed. Verse 20 says, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Remember who God gave you in your life. Remember what God has done to bring you to a church and give you leaders. Remember what God has done by surrounding you with people who knew what they were doing when you were still in the dark. Remember back to when you got saved and you got involved and everything changed. Go back to that. Okay? Especially if you're in a dark place right now that's causing you to complain and to cry out and to question God and want to give up. Go back. Remember. And then the psalm ends. It's like, well, what happened next? I mean, some psalms just kind of wind up and then taper down and it's like, awesome. This one just goes mm, and then poof. And it suddenly, abruptly stops. Because as soon as that lesson is learned and humility is achieved, the instruction is no longer needed. God will finally give you relief. It's over. And if you've ever been through that, sometimes the clouds part as quickly as they had gathered. All of a sudden, the sun is out and the birds are chirping, and you're like, what just happened? I love people again. <laughs> I, I want to praise God. I lived. <laughs> I'm here. And there's no way to explain it. Other than that God was involved. And that God was determined to teach you a lesson in humility. Is God trying to teach you? To be humble this evening? Well, sure. To some degree he is. Always. What grade are you in? You a kindergartner? Your only job in learning humility is to kind of like stay in the lines with your crayon. And that's so hard. <laughs> oh, man. That's, that's good for you. When you learn your lesson, I'll hang your picture on my fridge. It's progress. You in third grade, middle school? Oh, so hard. Then you got to deal with puberty. Emotions. It's crazy. Nobody likes me. You in high school? You're realizing that this doesn't end? in college where are you at in all this because some of us sad to say aren't learning so you should be in high school should be in college but as the author of Hebrews says you have to go back to kindergarten all over again and learn the elementary principles of the things of God. I'd like to move on to greater things. God would love to teach you deeper things, but you don't even know how to love people yet. You don't even know how to serve yet. It's not that you're not doing these things. It's that you're doing them so poorly that he just can't graduate you beyond kindergarten. You're outside of the lines. Put the crayon down. Get a new sheet, start over. Where are you at tonight? Is God making you into a humble person? Because he intends to conform all of us to the image of Christ. Jesus, the one who, in spite of any tension that there ever was with God, shut his mouth and served. Did what he was supposed to do.
never forgot his place, that he was not the father, he was the son. Never made an end run, never accused God of abuse, went along with the program obediently. He learned his lesson. Are you learning yours?